Welcome to Real Talk with Kieta. Today I am interviewing Savon Wade, the ex wife of NBA player Dwayne Wade. Uh, Savon, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to your lovely home. I was just one out of curiosity, and, I, and I, I'm so thankful that you invited me. You could have invited anybody because I'm sure people want to hear what you have to say. Because in the media, this thing has played out to be real ugly, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But I've never really heard your version or never seen pretty much anywhere where you've made comments. And what made you decide to actually give your version and your account of what your truth is? Well, I believe now I've overcome fear. You are afraid. Yes, I was. Simone, so, when did you actually meet Dwayne? Uh, we met when we were in like the fifth grade. Wow. And so you all became immediate friends? Yes. So you wasn't, that wasn't like your little buddy, like you liked him in the fifth grade. You all were just friends in the fifth grade. No, I didn't like him then, but mm -hmm. we were friends, yes. Okay. And so as the years progressed, your relationship obviously turned to something romantic. When did you actually start dating Dwayne? I think that I probably was 15 or 16 years old when we actually started dating. Wow. So you all been together for a long, well, you all worked together for a long time. Yes, we were. And during that time, when he was 15 and younger, what was his personality like? And what were you like during that time? Um, I think I was pretty outgoing, mm -hmm. very funny, mm -hmm. um, and friends. You know, we were friends. Although I was a female, you know, he was a male, I was able to, you know, interact with him like one of his, his male friends, you know, one of the, the guys. And he was, you know, loving then, and he was very, I would say maybe soft-spoken, very mm -hmm. humble, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. And during that time, from our, I read some things, he pretty much had a tumultuous childhood. Um, I read that his mother was in and out of prison. His father was abusive to his stepmother. How did you play a role in actually helping to soothe him or calm him or to connect with him on that level? Well, at that time, when he finally did confide in me about what was happening in his home and what had happened with his mom, he wasn't living with her at that time, you know, about drug use and in and out of her being in and out of prison. Um, the abuse was pretty bad in his house. Mm -hmm. And one night it gotten really bad and him and his sister, his younger sister had came to my home probably at like three o'clock in the morning or something like that. And I opened the doors and that's when I basically had to tell my mom what I knew about what was happening in his home and what was going on. Because I had to explain to her why he was coming to the door at that hour um, at, you know, 16 yeah. years old. And so um, I had spoken with my mom and I had told her what was happening and I asked her, is it any way that he can stay with us mm -hmm. and not have to live in that kind of environment? And your mother approved of this? Yes, she did. So during this time too, from my understanding, you all were dealing with the tragedy yourselves. Yes, we were. You lost your biological sister. Yes, the only sibling the that only I had. had. Yes. So, to me, it would seem as though that I can see that you would become close, especially if that was one of your closest friends, Dwayne, and he's confiding in you. I know that you felt extremely close to him to tell him certain things and to, to confide in him. Did that bring you all closer together? It absolutely did. Yeah. Uh, I would say at that time that, you know, that was my very best friend which is what, you know, and well, he was my best friend and I was his. That's what had us to confide in each other about things that, you know, weren't that easy to speak about or didn't have other people at the time, mm -hmm. you know, to trust with that sort of important things that was going on. Do you mind, Savannah, if I bring your mom out to speak to us about Dwayne living with you all? Not at all. Okay. Ms. Funches, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Savon was just explaining to me that in high school, you know, she was friends with Dwayne since fifth grade, you all know that, but Dwayne was having some family issues and she confided in you what he was dealing with. And eventually you let him live with you. 
How did all of that come about, and what made you decide to allow him to live with you? Well, it was the, the night he came to me, and when he said to me, mm -hmm. um, he had two black garbage bags, and he knocked on the door late at night, and he asked me, did I mean what I said? When I said what I said about children. What did you say about children? I had to ask him, what did I say? Mm -hmm. And he said that you would never let a kid be out in the street mm -hmm. with no place to go. Mm -hmm. You would never let a kid go hungry and you would always help them if they needed something for school, mm -hmm. you know, to take care of for school. And I said, yeah, I meant what I said. And he said, mama, I'm home. So I was like, okay. And I just told him to leave the garbage bags out there, shake them out, mm -hmm. separate them. And uh, first I was going to ask him what happened, but, you know, I believed it was the same stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know to what detail, and I just said, I'll wait till in the morning. Well, did you, did you know, Savon, that he moved in, or were you there when Dwayne actually moved in? I was not there. I actually was away at school. I was in college. Oh, you were in college? Yes. So you didn't even know that Dwayne moved in with your mom? Not right away, no. And why didn't you tell her this? Uh, I didn't want that to be a distraction because that was her first year going to college. Mm -hmm. And he was just getting ready to go to his last year of high school. And during this time, I know this was a very difficult time for you uh, because you had just buried your daughter, your only biological, your only other biological child of Mr. Vaughn. And I, first of all, I couldn't even imagine how that feel and how you all dealt with it. But in that time of mourning, you still opened your heart and allowed him to live with you. What was so special about Dwayne? Well, first of all, I can't take credit that, mm -hmm. that I did anything. God had to heal me mm -hmm. from the loss of my daughter. Mm -hmm. And then God had to restore me mm -hmm. to be able to take care of another child, period. Mm -hmm. Because when that happened to me, I had no intention of looking for another child. Mm -hmm. And that was between me and God, because I told him I was hurting too bad. Mm -hmm. So he had to give me a reason to even care, to love and to even take care of anybody else, because I was really wounded by that. Yeah. But you not only took him in, you went out of your way. You took him to tutoring, an hour out of your way. You did these things for a child that wasn't even yours, that a lot of people, or some people, don't even do for their own children. And that speaks volumes about your character. But I must ask you, and I just want to be honest with you about this, in light of what's happening now, today, do you feel betrayed by Dwayne? I didn't do anything special for Dwayne Wade. What you just said, I did exactly the same thing for him that I did for Savannah and Garrett. All the way to college, the exact same thing. When they got a bank account at 17, he did. When they got a driver's license, I took him to get his. When they left with a computer, he also left with one. So everything that God provided for me to give for my children, God got that same job and had me to provide it for Dwayne Wade. Mm -hmm. And that same job allowed you to do these things for a child, for Dwayne, but yet do you feel broken about what's going on today? I feel broken, I feel hurt, mm -hmm. and again, I had to go to God. Mm -hmm. I always resort to go back to God because I had to ask God why. Mm -hmm. The things that the abuse that has happened to my grandchildren, the things that has happened, you know, even though Dwayne went through abuse and everything, he will have to know this. God provided him a way of escape mm -hmm. out of the abuse. Mm -hmm. And then turn around and in turn to do this to my daughter mm -hmm. and his own children. I don't even know, I don't even know a word to describe that. The Dwayne you knew that you actually took him to your home and had him shake out the bags, okay? The black garbage bags that he came to your doorstep. The same young man who said, Mom, I'm home. Did you mean what you said? Is he a different person now? Do you even know this Dwayne Wade in, 2000, in 2012? Um... No, I do not know who he is. I just know that for me, 
I treated him just like my children. Mm -hmm. The ones that God birthed, gave me through birth, mm -hmm. even to the point of making him an heir. Mm -hmm. When I say exactly the same thing. And, and in spite of all that, it took God, he's still an heir today. But you love him, Ms. 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 As, a, as God would have me to love him, yes. But I do not love anything that he's done. Have you expressed that to him? No. But this same young man that you actually brought into your home, the sound of raising like your child, why is it that you haven't sat him down and spoke to him? You were the mother figure to him. So literally, it doesn't mean because you didn't give birth to him that you wasn't his mother. You raised him as your own. So you haven't felt the need to actually sit down and talk to him face to face and let him look at you, the same person who took your bed when he had nowhere to go, and look at you and explain to you why he's doing or why he's doing whatever he's doing and how it has hurt you. The last time that I took um, the children down to Trump Towers mm -hmm. and Dwayne was standing outside the building, mm -hmm. A young man, another son of mine, Toti, mm -hmm. he became very upset. Mm -hmm. You know why? why? For what you just said. He looked and he saw Dwayne didn't even speak. He had his nose in the air. And he was so hurt that when we came back with the children, he was later on that night, he said, what happened? He said, I asked him what's wrong with him. He said, I cannot believe it. This is the man you took into your home. He didn't even speak and acknowledge you. And I told him, I'm gonna give him a peace of mind. I never got an apology from the girl that killed my daughter to this day. God restored me. If somebody took my daughter's life and they never came and apologized to me for that, and God healed me, who is Dwayne Wade to not to speak to the one who fed him, clothed him, educated him? Because God is the one that did that for Dwayne. So that insult is not toward me, it's directly toward God. And if God made me the person I am to be able to stand and live and, and live my life and someone took my daughter from the earth and then he comes along right after that and he doesn't want to speak, that's between him and God. I don't have anything to say to Dwayne about that. That is directly between him and, and God. Welcome back to Real Talk with Kieta. We're sitting down here with Savon Wade, the ex-wife of NBA player Dwayne Wade, and Savon's mother, Mrs. Sanchez. Now, a question that I wanted to ask you was, I asked you earlier before the break, um, have you ever reached out to Dwayne to discuss what's going on and where did this go wrong? Has he ever reached out to you? Uh, yes, he has, through subpoenas, depositions, mm -hmm. um, having people to forge my signature, um, committed forgery, and the judge stood there and said he knew it, and they did nothing about it. So through the courts and um, all that mess, yes, mm -hmm. he drug me into that. That's how he reached out to me. So Paul, how do you feel about this? I mean, how do you feel about the treatment of your mother and the same woman that reached out to Dwayne and cuddled him in his time of need when he didn't have nowhere to go. How do you feel about the treatment of your mother? Well, I have felt very hurt because I know that it hurts her. And I know, you know, the time that he came into her life, you know, what was happening in her mourning my sister, you know, having died. And so I know that the relationship was very special. And for me to see their relationship broken and torn like that, for me to see him do things, you know, depositions or what have you to her, I'm not looking at it like then a wife or an ex-wife. I'm looking at it more so like, wow, that's, that's our mom. It's like, what is he doing? You know, he's hurting her. Do you feel like, well, do you think maybe he feels as though that you was taking sides with Savon? I mean, did you? Um, throughout the whole time that they were dating and even when they got married, I told both of them mm -hmm. when they did something wrong. And I told both of them when they did something right. Mm -hmm. 
and I've always told both of them I'm not on even one of their sides. Mm-hmm. I'm on God's side. Okay. So whoever's wrong, you're wrong. So in yeah. times that Savon was wrong as they were dating or when they was married, you would actually tell Savon when she was wrong as well as tell him when he was wrong. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know how kids are get mad you take it up for. Them. Mm-hmm. Well they will just both have to be mad at me mm-hmm. because I didn't care what neither one of them thought. I, I was on the side of God. Whoever was wrong and whoever was right and I told them about it. And so you all obviously continued to have a dialogue after you all were married and then when the children were born. When did it break down? When did it break down? It broke down when Dwayne had started doing things that was not what a husband or a father should have been doing. And I did say something back then. Mm-hmm. And his like reaction? Like I said, was, you know, well, by then I didn't, he didn't need to listen to anyone. Mm-hmm. He had changed? Yes. He in ways like? Well, let me put it to you this way. The love of money, it is the root to all evil. Mm-hmm. When people start worshiping money and thinking that it makes people gods, that's it. You can't tell anyone anything. So you're saying that once Dwayne became an NBA player, his whole attitude changed? Not long afterwards. Mm-hmm. Money to me, when people say money changes people, well, first of all, money has to change you because you can't do the same thing. Right. However, when you are a person that's really a deep-rooted person, a good person, money just reveals who you really are because you'll still be that good, giving, loving person. It doesn't necessarily have to make you a bad person. I think that attribute had to be within you before. That's just my personal opinion about it. And I'm just wondering, throughout the times he was living with you, there was nothing that you remotely even saw within Dwayne that could have presented itself and you just maybe overlooked it or? I saw the angry side of him, but when you say money, he didn't have any. Exactly. I paid him allowance money just to clean around the house so that he would have show money. I did that for my daughter, even some of his brothers and cousins. Same thing, they had a maximum, $200 to do. If it took 10 hours to do it or if it took a week. So you saw the $200 angry. was to keep them from out of the streets in the summer, mm-hmm. doing something to get money that was not legal. So, I mean, what did he have? You say you saw an angry side of him. Can well, you tell me about some examples of that? Oh, well, one time he punched a hole in my door, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I know a lot of things was going on at that house, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of things that was not good things that no child should endure. Savon, let me ask you this. You all came from obviously a well-rooted loved home. You and Dwayne get married. You all high school sweethearts. You all go from, did you did you have a job? Were you making millions back then? I'm just wondering. Nine millions, no. Okay, and Dwayne was homeless, pretty much living with you. Okay, you all went from having no money to millions of dollars. Overnight. Overnight. How did that truly affect you? I was scared. You know, we were in, in college together at Marquette, and I remember when the, the speculation and all the talk began about possibly he could go to the NBA. Mm-hmm. And I had sat him down, and I said, I'm hearing this, and I asked him to explain to me, you know, what was going on, and what is the likelihood of that happening. And when he told me, that he could actually go a year ahead of time, which was 2002, I asked him not to. And, you know, he explained to me about financially, he felt we'd be better off if he did. But I was telling him, I think that, you know, as far as our family is concerned, it was it was Zaire just then. Mm-hmm. And me and him, I said, I think that we need to make sure that our foundation is strong because I've never at that point had heard anything positive about families in that particular lifestyle. And I mm-hmm. said, I just think we need to you know, be married, let's work on that, let's let's build this, let's make this stronger and mm-hmm. focus on our family before we go into something like that. So I had my doubts, mm-hmm. you know, going in and I had my fear and I can't say that I didn't have reason, mm-hmm. you know, to be afraid of it failing because for me, you know, the family was more important than the fortune. How did you feel, Ms. Funches, when you heard about he could possibly go to the NBA in 2002? Did you 
actually encourage him to do this? No, I kind of discouraged it also mm -hmm. because I felt like he was only in his second year of college mm -hmm. and if he waited one more year, at least he would have three years under his belt and then it would be easier to graduate mm -hmm. and have a degree. Mm -hmm. Well, so once he was drafted, you all moved right to Miami? No, not right yeah. away. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent that first summer actually in a condo downtown in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once fall came, mm -hmm. then we moved to Miami. Miss Fonchi, did you ever expect for Dwayne to do anything for you once he became an NBA superstar? No. Matter of fact, I told him. Uh, the speculation was he was going to buy me a house because uh, I was nice to him. Mm -hmm. And I told him to put everybody at ease. He's not buying me a house and neither should he buy anybody else a house. Mm -hmm. He should buy a house for his wife and his son. Mm -hmm and learn how to pay his own bills. Mm -hmm. Don't even go there. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a house, I have a job. Mm -hmm. And even once, Shaquille O'Neal asked that same question and I told him, no, Dwayne is not going to, I'm not going to retire and for him because I'm going to keep my job. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the way it went. What, what's Savon, once you became an official NBA wife, you're down in Miami. We all know how Miami light, nightlife is. I'm just being honest with you. Miami's a different place. What was it like for you to be in a different atmosphere? I mean, you're from Chicago, born and raised. Now you're down in Miami. You all are multimillionaires, living in million dollar houses, driving fancy cars. Were you happy? It all depends on which day you ask me. I was happy because it was a dream of his to go to the NBA. Mm -hmm. And so his dreams somehow became even my own. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy because he was happy. Mm -hmm. I saw him fulfill his dream. I saw him, you know, set a goal and do it. And I was proud of him. I was happy for him. Mm -hmm. But when I realized that, you know, we had gotten this fortune and it was going to be an exchange for our faith, and our family, I was destroyed. When did, start, when did everything start changing? I would say the first time it started to get really bad mm -hmm. was the summer right after uh, he'd been drafted. That, that, that summer following the draft, he, um, I was over the phone with him and he had said something to me very, very angrily. And um, I was telling him about the way he was speaking to me, you know, mm -hmm. to stop being disrespectful and things like that. And he told me, do you want to go and, and live in your mother's house? Because that's what's going to happen. You're going to end up back living in your mother's house in Robbins. And, I, and I'm... Well, he used to live there. Yes, I was, mm -hmm. I was very shocked. But the threat mm -hmm. was like, do you want me to, you know, somehow cash you out mm -hmm. of, of our house and... and put you in a position where you're back living in Robbins in that house and it was just it was a very very awful feeling and I would say that we stayed together yes mm -hmm. but from there now that I look back and I can reflect on it I would say from that moment it went downhill as an NBA wife are you all expected to pretty much allow your husbands to cheat and just don't say anything well first of all I want to say and not not now. I'm not an NBA wife. I'm not an ex-wife. I'm not a basketball wife. Thank God. I finally know who I am and I have my own identity. But at that time, I certainly was married to him and the game and mm -hmm. the lifestyle. And I do think that that's the expectation. Absolutely. You're seen, but you're not heard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so many other women, you know, so many other wives that I've had the opportunity and been fortunate enough to console and they have consoled me mm -hmm. and Yes. So you would think though, just saying as an outside person looking in, you would think that when these basketball wives are married to these, you know, these, these men who make millions of dollars, what other reason could they not be happy? You would think that would be the life. Why did you have to console these women? What were they so hurt and upset about? Well, it all depends. I mean, there were women who were physically abused, mm -hmm. emotionally abused, financially abused. Mm -hmm. There were women who had... Uh, at the same time that they were pregnant, their husband had gotten another woman pregnant. There was a lot of adultery going on, mm -hmm. and it was just awful. It was awful. If you name it, it was happening. Was that was that new to you though? I mean, when you and Dwayne was in 
high school and going through college, you never had really issues with him cheating on you or dealing with other women? I had an issue in college, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. So did you think once you got married that issue was going to change? No, I didn't think it was so much marriage that we were doing. We were actually married at that time mm -hmm. that that happened. Um, but I was hoping after we got past that, mm -hmm. you know, and resolved that issue that we wouldn't have to revisit it. And when you got down to Miami, I guess you, not I guess, it's obvious that it was revisited. How did you address issues of infidelity with Dwayne? Or was he having affairs in Miami? Yes. I was hurt. Mm -hmm. um, I was angry, of course. But I would say more than even being hurt and angry, I was very, very disappointed. Because Dwayne had never been just my husband. He had been first my very best friend. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just like somebody cheating on somebody or somebody wronging someone. It was the kind of hurt that comes when a best friend turns on, a, on the other one. Ms. Fonches, do you, were you there when, you know, I know you were there, but how were you there for both Dwayne and Savon when everything just stopped going, just becoming chaotic? in Miami. Who would listen to you? Who would not listen to you? Who were you trying to talk to? What did you do? Did you try to intervene? Again, like I said, I was only on one side mm -hmm. and that was God's side. Mm -hmm. So whatever was wrong that I saw was wrong, I, I told him. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a shame if someone sees something and don't say something. Mm -hmm. So I said what I had to say when it needed to be said. Were you lonely, Savannah, in Miami? Absolutely. I absolutely was. I remember thinking, you know, I lived in a $4 million house, mm -hmm. fully furnished mm -hmm. with loneliness, abuse, betrayal, mm -hmm. sadness. It was, it, was, it was hard. It was the most difficult time probably in my life. Did you ever feel as though the betrayal of your ex-best friend, your ex-husband would escalate to this point that we are today, that you all are in today? No, no, I never, I never would have imagined that it wouldn't have got, it would have gotten this far. Mm -hmm. I have seen sides of him. Things have come out of his heart that somebody couldn't have paid me to believe were in there or that he would do or that he would say I mean, um, I have been in shock. I have literally been in shock. There's been times when I have even, you know, gotten upset with people and, and, and said to them, you know, before they tell me something like that, they better make sure that it's the truth. Because again, it was my very best friend, but unfortunately, it has been very real also. So you saw the changes right before your eyes? I absolutely did. I watched them happen and I tried to stop it from happening. I literally can say I tried to save him from himself, who I saw him becoming. You know, I tried to, to sit down with him. I tried to reason with him. I, I reached out to Coach Riley. I reached out to Coach Riley's wife. I reached out to other wives married to NBA players and, and sought their advice when I noticed it was, it was happening, that he was changing and changing for the worse. There's nothing wrong with change. Mm -hmm. But changing for the worse is bad. And I saw him in exchange for money and fame selling his soul. I saw him taking, you know, his character and exchanging it for yet another endorsement or yet another fan. And that was the problem. Now I'm going to ask you this and we're going to go to break. But can you honestly say that at one point in time, maybe you saw yourself changing a little bit too? Oh, absolutely. I went through it. I did. Mm -hmm. I think that everything, when I when I first got to Miami and I was able to observe other families, mm -hmm. other players, uh, other women who were mm -hmm. married to players, it was almost like a mental checklist. And I would say, those are things I never want to do. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to to be that kind of wife. I'm never going to do those sorts of things. You know, because I saw some women angry. You know, I saw them and, and it's, I saw some women sad and I watch women go from sad to getting even. And I was saying, I wouldn't be that type of woman, you know? Mm -hmm. But it seems like almost everything I said I would never do, 
I ended up doing it. There's a few things I missed on the checklist, but my change and my transformation, my wake up call, my realization that this is not right, and I have to get back to who I am and be true to myself, regardless of what the bank statement says, Mm -hmm. it just came very soon. It didn't take me long. Well, I'm glad that you did wake up. And I'm just going to tell you, seriously, I'm just asking you because I just want to know out of curiosity. Is he still in there? Yes, he is. In spite of him trying to have me arrested, in spite of him suing me, in spite of people forging my signatures, that's what you do to your real child. You don't disinherit them when they do something bad. You just discipline them. You discipline them. Now that, Ms. Funches, is what I call unconditional love. We'll be right back with more Real Talk with Kia. Welcome back to Real Talk with Kia. We're sitting here talking to Savon Wade. Now, Savon, when you were in Miami and you was going through all that turmoil and all that distress, you had plenty of friends, didn't you? I mean, you, the other basketball wives, you weren't like a, you weren't really connected or did you have any friends in Miami or? I mean, I did. I, I at least thought I had a lot of friends, mm-hmm. you know. More friends than somebody could count, you know. And would your friends come back and tell you something they were saying that Dwayne was doing? Yeah, they definitely would. Mm-hmm. And your reactions would be? I would be hurt. Mm-hmm. I would be angry sometimes. Disappointed. Were you two violent with one another? Has it ever gotten physical? Yes. Yes, it has. And... I have a report here in October of 2006 that you actually went to the hospital and you were pregnant. Yes, I was pregnant with Zion. And you were admitted to having abdominal pain. Yes. Can you tell me what happened here? Well, before, shortly before being hospitalized, I was in Florida and it was, I woke up in the middle of the night because I was sick, obviously with the pregnancy. And I noticed that uh, Mr. Wade wasn't in the house. Mm -hmm. And so I was calling him and I was calling him because it was probably like, I don't know, two or three o'clock in the morning and we went to bed together, which means he must have gotten up out of the bed and just left in the middle of the night without telling me. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking for him. I looked around the house. I was calling his phone. He didn't answer. He finally got back several hours later. It was well into the next day and I was very upset, you know, I was I was angry, I was, you know, asking him where was he and why did he just leave without saying anything rightfully to so. me. Rightfully so. Yeah, it was his wife, rightfully so. Rightfully so. And um, his response to me was first being verbally abusive, mm-hmm. he was cursing, he was calling me names, he was telling me shut the F up, uh, you know, women talk too effing much. and. You know, I need to know my place and, and things like that. And then that made me more angry. That made me say, like, you know, what is he talking? Women need to know their place. And why is he speaking to me like that? And then it turned into physical violence. He picked me up and held me over his head, literally, in midair, and threw me down in our bathroom. While you were pregnant? Yes, and while I was I pregnant. I just want to make sure we clarify. He knew you were carrying a shower. I'm not sure what he knew, but we had Zion on purpose. We planned that pregnancy. So. so that's what I'm saying. So he knew you were with child. Yes. And he picked you up. He picked me up mm-hmm. and he slammed me down. And we had an ottoman in the bathroom at that time, a piece of furniture in the center of our master bathroom. And he slammed me down so hard that when my back hit the ottoman, it broke into four pieces. And then my back and my head hit the concrete. Uh, the marble floor, excuse me, in the bathroom. And then after that I got up and I immediately went, there's a cordless phone in the bathroom, I immediately went to that phone and I was crying, I was hysterical and I was went to go call the police. And when I did that, I would say more hell broke loose. At that point, you know, I suppose because he was in fear of being exposed, because I certainly was gonna call the police. And I picked up the cordless phone, he snatched it out of my hand and he threw the cordless phone against my body so hard that the phone literally broke into pieces. Are you serious? Yes, I am, unfortunately. Was anyone there when that happened? Yeah, there were a couple of people there. No one was inside of the master bathroom. 
Actually, when I tried to run out of the bathroom, he came and with his body barricaded the door. Then he reached behind him and locked the door and stood with his body in front of it so that I couldn't leave the bathroom. So all, the only thing I could do was scream. You know, at that time he had a gun in the house and I was very afraid because the gun was in the closet and we were right there by that closet and him being so violent, I became like very desperate to get out. I just remember thinking, I really need to get out of here. It's like way beyond well, you, out of control. Honestly, at that point, do you really remember as far as, when I say remember, as you're speaking to me, are you going back to that moment? Yes, I am. Did you really, honestly in your heart, feel as though that you were in fear for your life? Absolutely. Without a question. I knew when he picked me up in the air like that, when the, when the furniture broke in pieces, and the amount of force that he was using, you know, I was even able to realize how physically strong he was at that moment. It was like, it was very scary. It was literally terrifying. So when you when when, when the phone was broken, how did you get out of the house? I was screaming and I was screaming, and then eventually, uh, there were other people in the house, and he had a male cousin that came to the door, mm -hmm. and I don't know if he came in the door, busted in the door or how he got in, but I know that the door eventually got open and I was able to get out and from there I left the house, I left Miami. And you went where? I went to my mom. I went to my mom in Chicago. Because this is where you felt safe? Yes. And so, and this is where you actually checked into the hospital? Yeah, when I went to my mom's house, you know, I didn't want to say anything to anybody else just because of the, the threats that he was making when I said I was going to call the police. So I went and I told my mom what had happened and that same day, like right when I got into her house, thank God I at least got in her, her care by that time, I literally fainted. And so my mom was picking me up off the kitchen floor and she drove me to Christ Hospital. As I read this report, it says that you had abdominal pain, you were complaining about that. Nowhere in here does it mention that you and your husband were actually physically fighting, that he actually threw you down, threw a phone at you and broke it on you. Why didn't you tell anybody? I, at that time, I knew in my mind that that was going to make it way worse. Savannah, did you confide in anyone other than your mother that Dwayne was physically abusive to you? Uh, a pastor at that time. And what did he direct you to do at that point? He prayed. He was more focused on, he gave me more advice for myself. He was saying that to make sure that I take care of myself because I had a son and to make sure that I stay strong. He didn't so much address whether I should stay married to him or not and you know whether we should get counseling or anything like that. He was just more focused on me not allowing what had happened and what had been happening to destroy me because I had a life and I had a son to raise. Do you feel like, Savon, that you gave up your dreams to support Dwayne's dreams? I absolutely did. Were you lost in that life? Yes, I was. I was, at that point in time, I would say a basketball wife. I was married to him, the sport, the lifestyle, you know, and I lost myself in all of that. I lost who I was. People wouldn't even address me anymore by my name. I wasn't even Savon anymore. I just became Dwayne Wade's wife, you know, and I just lost myself. I, I After all of this happened, I remember asking myself, now what did I like to do? I, was, I had to ask myself, what was I doing before the draft? And I had to sit and ask myself sincerely, what were my dreams? What did I plan to do? If, if this would have never happened or he never would have went to the NBA, what exactly was I doing before this happened to us, before he was drafted, before all this money came into the picture, before fame was an issue? And I had to, you know, with God's leading, find myself again, find who I was and my identity all over. Were women actually disrespectful to you, Savon? Openly disrespectful to you? When you were back to doing? Yes, they were. Some women were just very, very nasty. Um, probably the worst, one of the worst ones, just openly and in my face, 
uh, there was a woman who taken off her panties. And while I was walking uh, with Mr. Wade at that time, she taken off her panties and walked over to us. And she made just a disgusting, vulgar comment. And she had her panties in, in her hand. And when I was saying to him, just keep walking, she threw them. And so she literally threw them towards us. And that was right while I was walking beside him. Through all this turmoil and what all you were going through down in Miami, did you still have hope that it would work between you all before you all officially separated? Well, before I, you know, got into the lifestyle and lost who I was and even, you know, did things that I later regretted doing, I was always a woman of faith. You know, I was always somebody who believed in God. And so I certainly had faith, mm -hmm. you know, and I knew this. If I got into that lifestyle and I made some changes for the worse and God turned me around, I believe that he could be turned around. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that was really where my hope was in, where people can say, well, he's behaving to this magnitude. What makes you still have hope? It was that, you know, I wasn't perfect. And God, you know, he helped me. He restored me. He changed me. And so I was thinking, of course, with God's help, not anything in his own strength, mm -hmm. that, you know, there was hope for him. And then with that, there was hope for the family. Savon, does money truly buy you respect? Not respect, not happiness. No, it doesn't. What did it buy you? Well, I afforded a lot more problems. I can certainly tell you that. Did you have a lot of the yes ma'am and yes sir people around you? We had to jump. How high would you like us to jump people? We were surrounded uh, with them. We were and at that time, surrounded. and at that time when you were surrounded, you couldn't see that they was only around you because of what you all had. Oh no, I was completely blinded. I was flattered. I was com just just completely blind. I thought that they were all my friends. I was certain that they all loved me. You know, not too many places I would go that they didn't go with me. Of course, at my expense. And so, I, I mean, I thought honestly that they were my friends. I was completely blinded. You mentioned to me in the past that. You've heard Dwayne literally at the top of his long screen, everybody loves me. Do you honestly believe with the fortune and fame that he has now and then that he truly believes everybody loves him? I'm not certain about what he believes and I don't know if that's as important as the truth. And the truth is I know that everybody doesn't. I mean, even Jesus was crucified and he was Christ. You know, they crucified him. So I'm very certain that none of us here on the face of the earth just have it where everybody just loves and adores us truly. That's just not the case. That's not the case. Not at all. Well, we're going to talk more about a lot of different cases, and I also want to bring out your last standing friend when we get back from the break. We'll be back with more Real Talk with Kieta. <laughs>